morning. My name is Christine Mori, and I'm with Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services, um, otherwise known as SYFS. So at SYFS, we provide lots of different services to our community, outpatient counseling, positive youth development programming, mental health first aid certification, and we coordinate and run the Shrewsbury Coalition for Addiction Prevention and Education, otherwise known as SCAPE. And as we look in our community at the substance problems that we're facing, it's very evident to everybody that vaping has become a large issue for us. So today I have with me Tina Grosowski from the UMass Department of Psychiatry, Central Mass Tobacco Free Community Partnership. Thank you, Tina, for joining me today to talk about this really important topic. Could you tell us a little bit about your community, uh, Tobacco Free Community Partnership? Thank you for having me so much, Christine. Uh, the Central Mass Tobacco Free Community Partnership is a grant funded program from the State Department of Public Health uh, at UMass Medical School. There are seven other community partnerships around the state by region that work on uh, reducing smoking and secondhand smoke um, by uh, working on policies at the local level and regulations and we'll talk some more about that as we, as we go along I'm sure and uh, we work to provide resources to help ad adults uh, quit smoking and more recently uh, resources with, uh, uh, to address the vaping <coughs> epidemic that the Surgeon General uh, has uh, named it um, in, um, in Massachusetts. Sure, so that announcement came in December in 2018, correct? Yes. Um, and it sounds like um, increase in e-cigarette use is the largest one spike of any kind in the 44 years that substance use in youth data is being tracked. So we know and we, and we hear from parents and teachers and everywhere that it virtually seems like everybody is doing this. So um, if you could just start with telling us a little bit about what vaping even is. What is it? How is it delivered? What is in it? And um, let's start with that first of all. Yeah. So um, all electronic cigarettes have a battery in them that you uh, either turn on or charge. There's different um, disposable ones, there's rechargeable batteries. And, um, and then it has a cartridge with um, nicotine in a substance called propylene glycol. So when the, the glycol is heated up and then you inhale it, you get um, nicotine into your lungs and then you exhale. So they all have a battery, they all have a, either a cartridge or a, um, a, a um, canister inside to put the oil in and then when it's heated, you inhale it and you get the nicotine. So um, some old school uh, electronic cigarettes would look like this. Um, most young people are not using these nowadays. This has a battery in it and um, it, has an, it had an on and off switch. And then um, it's purple because it's flavored. The other really enticing component to um, electronic cigarettes for youth nowadays is the flavors and the flavors are what make it so attractive to young people. So this is a Juul a device, which is the most popular um, electronic cigarette that youth are using now. It was started by a couple of men in Silicon Valley who wanted to make a device that was high tech to help adults quit smoking. But it became really popular for many reasons, the flavor pods that go with it uh, being one of them. So. In, instead of having a cartridge that's inside the pod, you buy the cartridge separately, and it's so called that, a that flavor like pod. So that looks like just like a little USB. That looks like a little USB. And the Juul itself looks like a USB. And then it comes with what, ag again, also looks like a USB to charge it. So it's magnetized, and you put this into your laptop or computer, and you charge it up. When it's charged, then you insert the flavor pod into the device and then you inhale from it and then you get the nicotine. Again, the flavoring is the other disturbing component of this product and, and this is the second important takeaway, the first being the propylene glycol. It's not water vapor, so we really want parents and other adults to understand that. The second is the flavoring. So, you know, what I say in my presentations is, is this fresh mango juice from Market Basket in the flavor pod? And obviously it isn't. So how do they get this great flavor? Using a chemical called diacetyl. And diacetyl is the flavoring that used to be used in microwave popcorn that um, when, when heated up created that amazing flavor that makes you want to eat the whole bag of microwave popcorn. Until the FDA came into the companies and 
uh, saw that because of research that was happening, the um, discovery that the microwave popcorn workers were getting very ill, especially with lung. Popcorn um, lung. And that was the syndrome name that they were giving to it, popcorn lung, exactly. Bronchitis, respiratory infections, and even some cell anomalies when they w would look at the cell development in the lungs of the workers. So the FDA said, well, you can't use diacetyl anymore in the factories. So where they're using diacetyl now is in all of these electronic devices because they're not regulated by the FDA. And that's probably the third most important uh, piece of information. They're not a regulated product except for by age, which is important. Okay, so if a parent that's unfamiliar with these products would very easily mistake this for a USB drive. So I think the takeaway from this conversation is the most important thing that parents can really do is to familiarize themselves with yes. the um, with the devices that are delivering these chemicals um, to our kids. So um, is is this safer than smoking combustible cigarettes? Well, what we say is that they're less harmful than combustible cigarettes. We know the harm from combustible cigarettes. There's no refuting that. We don't have long-term data on these devices because they've only been around a short while. Um, since there's no burning combust, there's no com burning combustion in them. It's not producing the tar, which is what it causes the um, lung cancers um, in um, from combustible cigarettes. But uh, the devices themselves have trace chemicals in them. They produce some uh, um, carcinogens. And again, in the long term, we know carcinogens can lead to um, cancers. So what we say, it's less harmful than combustible cigarettes, but they're not harmless. Okay, so let's talk about nicotine because we know that nicotine is a highly, highly addictive substance, one of the most addictive substances, especially um, when introduced to an adolescent developing brain. Um, so I think there's a sort of an idea out there that this contains less nicotine than cigarettes and that it's safer or, or youth believe that they're not harming themselves. So tell me a little bit about how much nicotine is delivered in these pods. Yes, so in the Juul, it says right on the box, um, on the packaging, that each Juul pod, which is one of the little flavor pods, contains as much nicotine as 20 cigarettes, which is a pack of cigarettes. So that's a lot of nicotine even for an adult to use over the course of a day, but for an adolescent, it's really a lot of nicotine because as you uh, mentioned, the adolescent brain is still growing and developing, and introducing nicotine into it um, leads to, um, uh, you know, the research has shown it can lead to uh, disruption in brain circuitry. It leads kids not to be able to focus, to be able to pay attention, follow directions, which is what you want your child to be able to do to be a good learner in school. And it also fundamentally teaches the brain how to become addicted. If it's introduced as the first addictive substance into the brain, the brain learns how to become addictive. And then just like any other um, uh, element that's introduced in the reward system of the brain. It fires it off and it feels good. So similarly to fat, sugar, um, caffeine, um, then the brain says it wants more of it and that's the addiction process then starts. So then we do know that um, young teens do go on to use other drugs, especially now marijuana since it's so prevalent, and the brain has learned to become uh, used to using drugs and become addicted to using drugs in a very short time. So is it possible to vape marijuana in a Juul? It is possible to vape marijuana in a Juul. You can go online and Google how do I turn my Juul into a dab pen. Dab pen is the name of the uh, vape pen that is used for um, vaping liquid THC. As you know, THC is the element in marijuana that is um, the what gets you high. And um, you can buy it also in pods in um, a formulation of glycol. And then you can uh, uh, de put the device into cartridges or dab pens <clears throat> and vape it the same. Now, these just are so different from combustible cigarettes because they do not produce secondhand smoke. They do not smell like combustible cigarettes. So when you see a cloud of, of the secondhand um, aerosolized oil, that looks like secondhand smoke, but it has no smell like secondhand smoke. There is a kind of a fruity, musky scent that comes off the device. 
the similarly with um, the dab pen, um, there is no scent of your typical marijuana joint that you know parents nowadays uh, may have used in when they were in college. So that the other reason why these devices are so popular is that they're so disguisable in school. So as you mentioned, they all look so similar to flash drives. The dab pen looks very similar to this, so that in school, young people can use these devices and not be detected by uh, an adult because there's no smell, and they can hide them, s you know, very disguisable in sure, their shirt. Sure, just by or blowing it into their hoodie or... Mm -hmm. um, so, are there other products um, out there that deliver this with a... I, I've heard that there are products that deliver an almost no um, snow vapor cloud at all. Yes. There are some that do that, but you don't have to make the big vapor cloud. So teens can inhale the from the device and sort of basically kind of swallow the, you know, um, aerosolized oil, or as you say, just blow it down into their sleeve, blow it or a shirt, blow it into their sleeve, and it doesn't have to produce that big cloud. <clears throat> There's even I've seen ads for sweatshirts that have the strings, the strings. on the I've hood seen those attached. As well that have a device inside that you can um, inhale through the strings as a tube, um, the um, nicotine or liquid THC. So, um, you know, it's a way to deliver um, a drug, whether it's nicotine or THC, and it's profitable, so um, someone can make money off of it. So one in three 12th graders now are reporting using a vaping device. It, are there devices out there, many people believe that there are, that don't contain nicotine, that are just flavor? Well, none of the um, manufactured um, Juul or the other e-cigarettes that you buy in a convenience store or online uh, have no nicotine in them. They all have some nicotine, and obviously the Juul has the most nicotine. And it's also a formulation of nicotine called nicotine salts that delivers a real hit really quickly to the brain. And when you inhale it, it's very smooth on the throat, so it doesn't have any bitterness or bite to it, which also makes it attractive to young people. In a vape shop, they can sell um, nicotine, what they call juice, which is li the liquid. Um, to put in the larger uh, mod uh, vape uh, devices um, that they say has no nicotine. And in those it. come in like the little plastic bottles? Right. Okay. That looks like an eyedropper right. and then you have to drip it into the device. But again, these products are not regulated, so they can say they have no nicotine in them, but unless they've been tested to prove they have no nicotine in them, um, you don't know if that's actually the case or not. So let's talk a little bit about regulation and why this isn't, how did this happen that Juul was able to come out with this product and market it so aggressively towards young people when it was right. initially designed for an adult? Yes. When these products first became on the market a couple of years ago, the Juul uh, company said they were making this high-tech device to help adults quit smoking, and it was supposed to be aimed at adults. Um, but the device is so high-tech um, for young people, it's like having an iPhone 10 that delivers this hit of nicotine. And who doesn't want an iPhone 10? Of course. The technology is so enticing for young people. As well as the advertising and the marketing. The Jewel Company said that they were marketing towards adults, but if you look at the advertising um, itself, it's y y uh, youthful coloring. They're using young people in positions and making videos of them to make it look enticing and interesting for young people. So, um, and even more um, alarming in terms of regulation is that the online sales were not being regulated. So up until right before Christmas of 2018, any young person age 10, 8, 12 could go online, put in a birth date, put it in a gift card number, and many young people get gift cards from grandparents or aunts or of uncles course. for their birthday or for Christmas, and order a device and have it shipped to the house. So um, it exploded on the market and um, became very, very popular. And um, also Juul and the other companies were marketing their products using social media. So these are old tobacco industry tactics to use um, marketing and um, advertising to 
um, you know, um, educate people about the products or to advertise the products. And but the tobacco industry can't advertise on television or in billboards anymore right. because of the master settlement and other regulations before even the settlement. So by using social media where young people are, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, then they're marketing towards young people. They don't even have to use brand name. They can just use product placement in music videos or in ads that then are attractive to young people. And will there be any regulation prohibiting that from happening? Well, that's what we're uh, hoping and looking at right now. The FDA um, came out just before Christmas. Um, the new director said that it was going to be asking the jewel companies and the other online companies to stop their sales by um, on their websites, and um, they have done that part. Now they've proposed regulations to eliminate all sales of flavored products in convenience stores and gas stations. Um, they're in what is called a deeming period now, so they're open to public comment on the FDA website. So anybody can go and make public comment on there. So we urge parents to go and make public comment on there. Right. To say um, how dangerous these products are for young people. And the end result, we hope, is going to be that these products will be regulated in the marketplace. But in Massachusetts, what uh, we've done um, through the Massachusetts Tobacco and Cessation Pro Pre Prevention Program is say we don't want to wait for the FDA to come through with these regulations. Even if they did come through with the regulations, it's possible that a different director or a different Congress could come through and change the regulations. So a new uh, local regulation here in Massachusetts called the Flavor Restrictions. Over 144 towns have instituted the flavor restriction through the Board of Health in their town. That flavor restriction moves all flavored tobacco products to an adult-only establishment, which means a vape shop or mm -hmm. a tobacconist. There is even a couple of towns now, Somerville and Needham, that have included menthol into the flavor restriction. So menthol is a protected flavor from the industry um, through um, you know, the industry lobbying to keep that out of being um, what's considered a flavor. So um, usually when a uh, city or a town has tried to prohibit the sale of menthol, they've been sued by the tobacco industry. And Somerville did pass this as a regulation. They are being sued by um, a local uh, law firm that is being essentially representing the tobacco industry. <clears throat> and fortunately, they have some really great pro bono lawyers that are going to be working on this. So we hope that that will stand as a test case and that other towns will go forward, at least with the flavor regulation itself. Sure. And then they can look and see if they want to include menthol as a product. I will say that of all the jewel flavors that are on the market, mint is one of the most popular from young people. That's what they tell us. So um, often mint is considered like menthol and is uh, actually a protected flavor as well. So that's another reason why we'd like to see um, the menthol being included in the flavor restriction. Yeah, of course. So um, if people are interested to see what town um, have instituted the flavor restriction, they can go onto the state website, which is called Make Smoking History. There's a drop down menu. You can put in your town, so if someone lives in the town of Shrewsbury, they can look up Shrewsbury and see whether or not the flavor restriction has been included in the town tobacco regulations. So tell me how much kids are spending on this, because a pack of cigarettes is about $10, $11, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So is it less or more expensive to be buying these products? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it varies and it depends on when you bought them. If you bought them before Christmas time, you probably were able to purchase online uh, for under $20, um, even maybe more cheaply because of coupons that were being given away. Uh, young people were ordering multiple packs uh, or kits of the Jewel online and then going to school and selling them. If you remember, we talked about how much nicotine is in a flavor pod. If it's equivalent to one pack of cigarettes. So the, the flavor pods in Jewel come in a pack of four, and they are um, sold separately from the Jewel in a kit for between 8 to $10. So for the same pack, 
price as a pack of cigarettes, $10, you can get the equivalent of $40 worth of nicotine with the Juul itself. So um, young people are spending money on these products, but they're also able to get them at um, reduced prices, at, at least up until recently. And on average, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how many of these Juul pods would we see a young person going through daily? And what they tell us in our research is that they will use at least one pod throughout the day because they can use it at school right. surreptitiously, and then maybe even start on a second one when they get home or after school. They also So that's, again, equivalent to a, a pack of nicotine sure. worth of, of, of um, Juul. They also share them a lot. You know, um, Many high schools have been reporting to us that, like in the old days when um, young teens um, in high school would go and use the bathroom to smoke in, young teens will go into the bathroom now and use their jewel and share them among each other. So just from a public health standpoint, we know that's a concern. Um, but then um, they're um, being able to use the bathroom as a place where they go and use jewels. So then again, they're using up uh, more of the pod and sharing it with each other. And so Juul is the most popular, we know that. Are there other products that are coming on the market now that parents need to be familiar with? Sure. So once the tobacco industry recognized that the Juul was so popular, they decided to started to make their own brands of similar devices. So this is from um, one of the major tobacco companies. It's called Blue. And the kit itself um, comes with the device, which, as you can see, looks very similar to the Juul, a little bit bigger. And it also has its own flavor pod of uh, oil that you can see is, is leaked here. And um, then it has a charging device it's, itself. As far as price, these are cheaper than um, the Juul device. You could probably can get one for under $20. There's another product called Bow, which again, very similar in shape and size. They're coming out with new products all the time. There's some that look like um, cell phones, there's some that look like credit cards. There's some. There's a new product called a Soren, Soren Drop, and um, we have photos of those that we'll share um, on the uh, online with the viewers um, on the video. So um, these products are um, changing all the time, which is how the tobacco industry has always um, worked in the industry, coming up with new products that they're enticing to to people through advertising. So we, we don't have a whole lot of time left, and you know what I really want to talk about before you leave us is what can parents do to protect their children, to help their children once they're addicted? Because what's happened, unfortunately, is that we now have a generation of kids that are addicted. So responding uh, in a purely punitive fashion really isn't effective because we need to help with treatment to get these kids um, to break this habit. Yes, that's a really great question. Um, Right now, we're um, trying to encourage uh, scientists to do research on this topic. There is no best practice to, for how to help a young person quit vaping. There are some protocols that were developed to help young people quit smoking, and those were taught to school nurses, uh, had some training on how to help young people quit smoking. So we're hoping that that will be um, you know, modified to include vaping now. If I were as a parent, I would say, um, that what the best thing to do if you think your child is addicted to nicotine is have them see your pediatrician or a primary care provider um, to talk to the provider about um, what is the effect of nicotine for a young person and educate them on what's happening for them. Many young people are realizing that if they're going to the bathroom every hour on the hour to use the Juul device, that means they are addicted to the device. It's an educational process. Um, and um, we are lucky because there is a nation, uh, national organization called the Truth Initiative that was started after the master settlement um, to educate people about um, teen and adolescent smoking that has now come forward with some um, teen uh, vaping cessation um, platforms. And especially because they're online platforms and use uh, the uh, phone, which we know where young people are at now. So um, I believe we'll also share the information for the texting uh, and phone number that a young person could go online and enroll in the texting um, 
cessation um, counseling or coaching. We know it's very similar to quitting smoking. A young person has to um, look at their, um, their vaping uh, use, how much nicotine they're using, and being able to understand um, how to deal with the cravings and the withdrawals for when they stop using and how to change their behaviors uh, to more healthy uh, constructive ones. So the one thing that I would say to all parents is to talk to your kids, educate yourselves, familiarize yourself with these products, um, talk to them about what is known, what is not known, just frankly and authentically and honestly. We know with any substance, um, parental involvement and open discussion is really very effective and lowers the risk of your teens using any of these products. Um, raise your antenna and keep an eye on what they're doing and you know Tina gave us some great examples of if they're disappearing every hour or if they've got a hoodie um, just pay attention and have open conversations as always Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services is here um, Tina I, I can connect you with Tina for questions or presentations for parent groups and people can look on the new website which is called Get Outraged which we hope people are outraged about this pro problem um, getoutrage.org that has lots of information for parents and community members. It has um, frequently asked questions. It has how you can talk to your young person about vaping. And it has uh, information for cessation as well. There's a school toolkit for schools for curriculum on vaping prevention. So it's a very nice, robust website that's on getoutrage.org. Okay, is there anything else that you think is really important for parents or families to know out there before we wrap up? Well, I would say, um, again, looking at um, policy in the lo local communities because you can uh, institute programs, you can have educational curriculum in your high school, but we've seen from research that local policy leads to statewide policy, and statewide policy together with local policy really um, puts in a framework for regulations that limits the youth access to these products. So um, you may know that the state recently passed a new regulation to increase the sales age to 21 for tobacco yes. and um, in, in included that with um, no sales of tobacco in any pharmacies starting the January 1st and also includes vaping in the smoke-free workplace law. All that work was started at the local level, town by town, so the more parents and community members can get involved in local policy and regulations. It changes the built environment in which the young people grew up and, and live in. Tell us the website one more time where parents can go. Getoutrage.org. Getoutrage.org. Please visit the website. Um, contact us at Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services at syfs-ma.org or at 508-845-6932 with any questions or concerns. We're always here to help you and your family stay healthy. Thank you so much, Tina, for joining us today. I think this is really important information to get out into the community, and we appreciate our partnership. Thank you for having me. Thank you.